Hello, welcome back to History of Wine and the Vine. I'm Emily Kate. Today's topic is wine and death. We're going to be discussing the social role of wine and death, the connection between funerals and banquets, evidence from the tombs, as well as the role of wine and death in religion. So we're going to start out with an image. And this is an image of a silver item, and it actually has um, skeletons on it. And beside it, we have a quote that I'll read for you. It's by Petronius, and he says, he's talking about um, at a banquet, this is a Roman banquet, and he's discussing how amidst all of the revelry and partying and drinking, everything stops for a moment, and somebody brings out a skeleton. Now it's not a real skeleton, but somebody brings out a either a silver or wooden skeleton and kind of bangs it about on the table. And this is supposed to remind everybody of their eventual death and to encourage them to have a good time when they are alive. So I'll read for you the quote. He threw it, the larva, which is the skeleton, down once or twice on the table, so that the supple sections showed several attitudes. And Trimalchio said appropriately, Alas for us poor mortals, that poor man is nothing. So we shall all be, after the world below takes us away. Let us live then, while it can go well with us. So as you can see, the skeleton is kind of there to remind people that one day they won't be around and to enjoy the time that they have on Earth. Now, this is one aspect of how um, death kind of found its way into the social life of the people. There's also a um, Greek moralist named Lucian, and he was around 100 AD, and he spoke about not a fake skeleton being placed on the table like in this Roman <laughs> Roman example. He actually spoke about claiming that he had seen with his own eyes, which we can take with a grain of salt, but that he had seen the Egyptians salting and drying um, deceased people and then having them as guests at their banquets. So this presents kind of an interesting difference as we have here in the Roman banquet, we have that they had uh, skeletons, fake skeletons, just to remind you of your mortality, versus Lucian, who's now claiming that he's seen the Egyptians actually have dead bodies as guests at banquets. So you can make <laughs> with that uh, what you will. And But that's not the only connections uh, between banquets and funerals. There was, um, according to uh, Seneca, who died around 65 AD, he tells of a man named Pacuvius, who was a Roman who adopted Syrian traditions. And this Roman man, uh, almost every night, and certainly every night that the, he had a banquet, he would, at the end of the banquet, at the end of all the drinking and all of his friends were there, he would have his own funeral over and over and over again and he would have eulogies said about him and he would be anointed with oils and carried out as though he were completely dead and um, this happened every night he was not dead he was perfectly alive he woke up the next morning but he li he said that he liked to do it because it it kind of stressed that he would live his life to the fullest every day kind of uh, YOLO type of attitude that he wanted to always make sure he had no regrets and that if he didn't wake up the next morning, that was okay with him. Now, this connection we kind of see on the flip side, and I'll show you an image here. And this image is from Amiternium, and right here, as you can see, this is a funeral march, the entire thing, and this right here is the dead person. And this dead person is actually in the exact pose that somebody would be if they were at a banquet. So on the one hand, we have a man at a banquet who's pretending to be dead every night and have a funeral. And then on the other hand, we have an image of a relief where it's depicted that somebody who's having a funeral is being posed as though they are simply at a banquet. So we have this kind of 
connection between the two, a kind of seamless integration from living and going to banquets and being dead and somehow still going to banquets. So that part is pretty interesting. We also have interesting um, evidence from tombs. So we have tombs. Ancient Egypt was very stratified. We have very um, common tombs. And then we have the more exquisite, fancier tombs. So in the burial of a commoner, I'm going to show you another image. This is an example of a burial of a commoner. Now, if you see here, this is the skeleton. And this right here is a jug of wine. And this is just a different view of it. Here's the jug of wine, and the skeleton would be in here. Now, from that, that's a pretty interesting thing, because if you um, remember, if you watched the Ancient Egypt video, you'll know that people, commoners in Ancient Egypt, did not drink wine. They drink beer. So this tells us that wine was very important in the afterlife. If you weren't drinking something, pretty much at all during your normal life, but you were making sure it was in your grave for the afterlife, it was pretty important. I actually have for the um, more upper class people, they had offering lists that were in their, um, that were in their tombs. And I'll show you a, a picture of one, an example. And I hope that you can see, here's the offering list and here's just a person for comparison. And these offering lists, what they would have is, they would have things that people wanted available to them in the afterlife. So essentially, part of this was a wine list, was like a dream wine list that you would want to have available to you um, in the other world. And so this was, these are two ways that were just kind of explaining how things are, how um, wine was really important in burial and in death. And of course, the wealthier people wouldn't just have wine lists, they would or offering lists, which included wine. I like to call it wine lists. They would also actually have um, tons and tons of wine buried with them, which is partially how we know what we know um, about a lot of the wine from ancient Egypt. Now also we have very interesting is the religious aspect. So this kind of leads a little bit of credence to why um, wine and death were so incredibly interconnected. And I'll read you a quote. Now this quote is Plutarch quoting Exodus. And he says, um, the Egyptians thought that wine was the blood of those who had once battled against the gods and from whom, when they had fallen, had become commingled with the earth, they believed the vines to have sprung. So this idea of that wine was actually blood of something and that the wine was not only blood of something, but blood of warriors who were fighting gods. I mean, this is really powerful imagery. And furthermore, the idea that war and savagery and these kinds of um, very crazy um, <laughs> images came to mind for people, uh, I want to tell you about the god Shesmu. So Shesmu was the Egyptian wine press god. So there was different wine god, and this is not like when we think of Bacchus or Dionysus from Rome and Greece. This is not the same thing, because this wine press god was completely savage and destructive and all kinds of horrible things. And I'll show you a depiction um, of the wine press. And so here you have, here's the wine press, and these are actually human heads. These three things right here, so this is the wine press, and they're actually pressing human heads. So this idea of blood coming out and death and savagery and all of these things were all wrapped up into one with wine. So lots and lots of connections happening there. I hope you found this as interesting as I do, and uh, keep learning about wine and death, and I'll catch you next time. Cheers!